If you're interested in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me where we can look over your data or discuss anything sleep, I've left a link in the description. So today we're gonna go over the famous maxillomandibular advancement surgery. This is something many of you are already quite familiar with, but for those of you who are not, this is a pretty common surgery. And one of the reasons there's so much attention on maxillomandibular advancement is because commonly it gives the best results in comparison to the other sleep surgeries which are available, which there are many. Of course, all surgeries need to be tailored to each patient and MMA is not for everyone, but with respect to favorable outcomes, maxillomandibular advancement is number one. Now this study is going to cover 25 years of experience by arguably one of the best MMA surgeons in the world, Dr. Casey Lee. Many of my viewers are probably quite familiar with Dr. Casey Lee because, well, his experience and expertise speaks for itself. He's been around the block. He worked under or with Dr. Christian Gimeno, who is considered the founder or father of uh, obstructive sleep apnea. He's probably one of the surgeons who's done the most MMA cases in the world. I don't know who else would be considered in the leaderboard here, but as you'll see in the study, he's done over a thousand MMAs. He's triple board certified. I'm not one to attach a lot of importance to the letters that come after someone's name. I think all of you have firsthand experience of how that can be misleading, though being triple board certified is kind of a big deal. He has his specialties in otolaryngology, oral and maxillofacial surgery, and then facial plastic and reconstructive surgery. And of course, he he's out of Stanford, which is the mecca of sleep medicine. So that's all just to say that Dr. Casey Lee is, is certainly one of the more reliable sources of information. So what I'm gonna do in this video is I'm gonna go over his data. I'm gonna try to present it in easy to understand language that everyone gets to watch. And what's interesting is actually he divides his data up into the first 500 patients and then the second 500 patients, which is interesting. So we can get an idea of what one of the veterans of MMA surgery changed with respect to the way he does the surgery over a long period of time and over many patients. Anyways, we like Dr. Casey Lee. He's contributed a lot to this field. I hope to interview him one day. He's a fountain of information. So here's the first table of information that we're gonna look at, okay? I'll go through it slowly. I'm not gonna look at everything because some stuff's not as interesting. You can always, of course, pause the video and look at stuff yourself and you can ask questions in the comments section where myself and I'm sure many others will be willing to answer questions. You can see here, N equals 1,010. So 1,010 people are included in this data. Not in every case, it changes. We can see right here, for example, for the BMI, there's only data collected on 908 people. So just keep that in mind, but more or less, it's, it's a lot of people uh, for every one of these rows. So, so out of all of the thousand people, the average age of the patient was about 40 years old. 77% of them were men. So RDI, before MMA, the average was 39. Post MMA, it was 13.6. The lowest oxygen average before MMA was 83% and after 89%. So that's a pretty significant increase. As you can see too here, the p-values are excellent in every single one of these rows. So I'm not going to be talking about that. They're pretty consistent across the board. For sleep stages, uh, we can see that the total sleep time did not change by much. However, REM sleep increased drastically. Deep sleep increased arguably drastically, but still, but I would say not into a range that we would prefer. But you can see that this is essentially more than doubled and REM sleep went up by more than 50%. So the RDI surgical cure, which is considered in RDI that's less than five, was about 20% or one out of five. So this is actually one of my favorite tables because it kind of demonstrates what changes the surgeon has decided to make uh, through the course of his career. So the first 500 is found in this column and then the, the second 500 or the more recent patients are found in this column. So let's look what the differences are. Age, so you can see he, he's now doing surgery on a lower average age than he was doing with the first 500 patients. He's now doing surgery on more women. He's now doing surgery on people with a lower BMI. Now I'm speaking in generalizations here, of course, right? There are still people who have a high BMI and, it, and he's doing surgery on them, but we're looking at averages here. 
You can see also that he now does surgery on average on patients with a lower RDI and a higher SpO2 nadir. You can see now that the average RDI post MMA is much lower. It's almost cut in half. That, of course, is at least somewhat of a function of him choosing to do MMA on lower RDI patients on average. But, of course, you know, this is kind of difficult to parse apart. I don't think we know exactly why. You know, he, of course, probably got better at MMA. And then, of course, the patients, uh, on average, had a lower RDI. So which is, and to what degree those are contributing, uh, we can't actually know by looking at this table, but just food for thought. Remember, so surgical success rate, it says just down here, it's defined as the percent of subjects, patients, with an RDI or an ODI less than 20 per hour, and, so this has to happen as well at the same time, at least a 50% reduction in the RDI or ODI after the surgery. And we can see that's gone up a little bit as well, which is good. And here's just a nice generalized illustration of what MMA looks like. We have the pre-operation pictures here and then post-op here. You can see pre-op that there's, there's all these little white things sort of over the teeth. That would be the orthodontics or the braces. And then you can see afterwards that there's all these larger white things that are on the face as well. Those are the plates to keep the bones in place. And I hope that you can see as well that the maxilla and the mandible have both been advanced anteriorly. And you can see that a little bit better in this side profile case. You can see that this texture is similar to this texture and in between them, there's an inconsistency in the texture and it's darker. That would be the advancement in the mandible. And the maxilla as well came forward this way. And same thing down here, you know, all this white stuff, this would just be the orthodontics. And these again are the plates that are holding the bones in place after the surgery so that the bones can heal and the new face can consolidate. Hey guys, so just a few miscellaneous thoughts that I want to add to the content of the video. I personally went way down the rabbit hole trying to figure out what is the deal with surgery. And here's some of the things that I've learned. Take it for what you will, you know, I'm just some random guy on the internet, but Number one is, personally, I would not advise for anyone to get a surgery like MMA from a surgeon who doesn't actually hyper-specialize in sleep disordered breathing. There's enough error in itself, even at the forefront of sleep surgery medicine. And so rolling the dice with someone who doesn't really do MMAs and work with a lot of sleep disordered breathing patients is probably not a very good idea. I don't have a randomized controlled trial to support this position, but it's just my intuition or, or general feeling after being in this space for so long and talking to so many other patients. Number two, the idea of MMA I think is mismatched with the reality of it. And what I mean by that is it seems like everyone views MMA as like this crazy chronic pain accompanying radical, super brutal and invasive surgery. And that may have been the case, I think, in the past, but now I would say that they've improved the techniques and the, the entire procedure to a point where, you know, the, the, the post-operation recovery complaints are nothing like they were in the past. Some of these top surgeons are doing this surgery in like an hour and a half. Uh, people are going back to work far sooner than they did in the past. And yeah, number three, I recommend everyone try to obtain several independent consultations. Uh, you know, don't lead the witness at all. Go in there at baseline. Don't forward them, you know, the scans and results, for example, from the surgeon that you just had a consultation with before and see what they have to say. The optimum outcome is that they all say the same thing and they converge on the same generalized surgical plan. If not, then, you know, maybe that'll warrant further inquiry on your behalf or you know, some more questions. But the idea is that hopefully you know, independent top experts all see your candidacy for X surgical path in the same way. Number four, aesthetic outcomes are typically favorable, not unfavorable. You know, this makes sense because when the surgeons do these surgeries, they try to approximate your ideal. All these things are you know, interwoven. 
the the beauty of your face is tied to essentially the optimality is that a word of your airway or in other words you know the more your airway is close to its ideal so too will the the beauty of your face and one other thing i just wanted to mention too is that what's nice is a lot of these surgeons now have virtual surgical planning uh, software and you can get an idea of what you might look like after surgery which i think can also help sort of calm some nerves for people number five if an mma goes wrong it's not the end of the world yes of course it's better that everything goes right on the first try but the point I want to make is that there are revision MMAs. A lot of the top sur uh, sleep surgeons will, will do the revision MMA. So if you, you know, get an aesthetic outcome that you're not hyped about, or if your sleep isn't drastically improved, um, you know, it's not the end of the world. There is typically still more opportunity. That said, you know, you don't want to haphazardly get a, an MMA. That's not what I'm saying. And, you know, one of my favorite sayings is that I'm not rich enough to make cheap purchases. Or in other words, I'm not rich enough to buy cheap things. And I think that definitely applies in the context of surgery. You do want to get it right the first time. But if for whatever reason, you know, you come out on the other end with suboptimal results or aesthetics, there's still a chance to redeem it is all I want to say. Another thing I want to touch on is that there's this other surgery called maxillary expansion, which is essentially increased in popularity over the years and the main reason for that is that we need to be able to breathe through our nose mma surgery okay the mma surgery was successful big advancement the patient was still symptomatic okay still can't breathe through his nose still very tired so i said well <laughs> you can't breathe through your nose the nose is basis of of breathing so he was expanded. This is week one. And yes, although maxillomandibular advancement surgeries, orthognathic surgery, does oftentimes improve nasal breathing, and the surgeons can also actually, you know, put in an additional effort to make that endpoint the case. Some patients need to first improve their nasal breathing through, let's say, a preliminary surgery before they do MMA. That's the optimum path. And this seems to be the case for a lot of different patients. So all I'm trying to say is, you, you know, make sure you do the, your due diligence and you find out which surgery you are the strongest candidate for and do that. Number seven is, I would say, take your time, take all the time you need in the world to figure out if you are a candidate for this, if this is something you want, if, you know, this is the path that you want to take. There's no rush. Uh, and, you know, I would say the average time that patients take to consider this as an option, given the firsthand experience I have uh, speaking with many, many patients, just being in the Discord forums and on Facebook groups and so on, so is, is years. I mean, three years, four years. You don't need to take three or four years, but it should um, add some color to a picture of, of that. You know, it is a pretty serious decision. You want to take your time. Your face is going to look different. Number nine. And again, I encourage people to challenge this if this isn't the case, but it seems that, you know, at the end of the day, you can't account for all uncertainty with respect to an MMA surgery. You, you kind of just have to roll the dice after you do do all the legwork of figuring out what you can figure out. Or in other words, there is risk. Uh, nothing's guaranteed in, li in this life. Uh, sleep is complex. This surgery is complex. We're dealing with your face. And, you know, the outcomes are not always exactly as we expect them to be. If you guys want more sleep surgery type content, I highly recommend going over to the Jaw Hacks channel. Jaw Hacks is a uh, top G and he, uh, he interviews many of the top surgeons in the States. So go over there and you know, I think that can take some of the edge off for you guys and, and give you guys more answers to some of the technical questions that you might have. Last point, a lot of patients are going to need orthodontics for typically a very long period of time prior to the surgery. It's not always the case. Some surgeons will do the surgery first and orthodontics afterwards. But for the most part, patients are gonna to have to go through a long period of orthodontic treatment to align your teeth in the way that the surgeon would like your bite to line up post-surgery. So, and that takes up to, you know, like a year and a half in a lot of cases for patients. So 
it's recommendable to sort of get the ball rolling if you are you know, leaning towards strongly considering MMA or orthodontic surgery as an option for you because it could be a long wait still. Also, I'll post all the relevant links that I made reference to in this video in the description box below. And I also wanna let you guys know that I have planned to interview actually some patients who've gone through the surgical process, some of which have been cured. So stay tuned, sub, all that stuff, and uh, I'll see you soon. Good luck. We're all gonna make it. <laughs>